Hi everyone, I'm going to talk about Bitcoin and war, how Bitcoin is an asymmetric weapon against more powerful adversaries and how it ultimately changes the dynamics of war in the power structure of governments and their citizens. Before I begin though, I want to give a shout out to Ledin, they're one of my sponsors. Ledin is the best place to borrow against your Bitcoin using it as collateral. Um, I personally use it, not for that purpose, I lend out my Bitcoin and earn a yield, um, but definitely check them out and if you have any questions around how they go about this or the risk management that they use, go check out my profile. I've got a pinned tweet that talks about um, how they how they manage risk. Okay, cool. Let's go ahead and jump on in through to the topic. So I first write this on Thursdays uh, with my newsletter called The Held Report. So the, there should be a subscription link that pops up right here. Um, if you want to subscribe to get it first on Thursdays, otherwise you're gonna hear it here on Sundays. Cool, so Bitcoin and war. The word pay is derived from the Latin par, pay car, meaning originally to pacify, appease, or make peace with through the appropriate uh, unit of value customarily acceptable on both sides. So money and peace and money and, and pay are all intertwined. Uh, the history of war is closely intertwined with the history of money. And so from sticks and clubs to manned aerial vehicles and laser guided missiles, war doesn't really change. War changes a lot, but humans remain the same. And so war has changed quite a bit. Um, and so money as well has changed too. So money uh, even though money has similar properties, each new money like gold versus modern money versus Bitcoin. Um, you know, Bitcoin and the evolution of money started with shells and beads, gold, then fiat, and now crypto. So, or B Bitcoin more precisely. And so I think what's really interesting is how Bitcoin changes that dynamic. And so um, while the internet made it possible for us to, you know, do PayPal and ACH and, and, and new ways to transmit money, um, you know, change the money, change the world is the popular saying, and that's ultimately how, you know, money changes everything, including war. So, um, you know, Bitcoin has an uncensorable digital money, pays no attention to international borders, and has some pretty awesome implications. So to my main point here, Bitcoin is asymmetric warfare. Um, asymmetry refers to a lack of correspondence in shape, size, or arrangement, or without symmetry. So, um, but to talk about asymmetry in warfare is really to talk about one size advantage over one another. Uh, right now we're seeing people discuss constantly Russia versus Ukraine, and it's easy to think about these two sides of a conflict, one country against another, but the third country is, uh, the third side is the people, the civilians in between the two powerful politicians or governments trying to battle it out. And so Bitcoin is this tool that can be handed to either population, whether it be Russians or Ukrainians or Americans, as this tool to uh, give them asymmetric power over the most powerful governments in the world. Uh, what do I mean by that? Is that Bitcoin, the monetary policy is not going to change. So anyone across the world can take advantage of Bitcoin's monetary policy, the best monetary policy in existence. People anywhere across the world can take advantage of the fact that trying to guess a Bitcoin password to a um, to a Bitcoin wallet. So like, let's say you ran, let's say you wanted to cr crack a private key and you ran through every single permutation it would take every computer ten, on earth 10,000 years combined to go crack that password. So Bitcoin is incredibly, incredibly powerful in terms of its ability to store value where governments can't seize it. And that's what I mean by asymmetric. The most powerful governments in the world can access it, can't access Bitcoin, your Bitcoin wallet, because of this asymmetric guarantee of if you've done your private key management properly, there's no amount of money or computing power that they could have to actually go seize your keys, which is really, really cool. And so more than 14 million Ukrainians have taken refuge outside their country since Russia kicked off its special military operation. Um, and for those staying long or permanently, it's not an easy proposition to just like stand up and, and leave your home and leave everything behind. And a lot of them probably found themselves bankrupt immediately. They probably had uh, local Ukrainian currency and they didn't know how to get it out of there. Um, and also in Russians, uh, Russians as well, you know, Russian, the civilian Russians have left in droves and they can't move their money out. It's it's super difficult to do all uh, the U.S. and Western nations have frozen um, a lot of the financial infrastructure for Russians, uh, civilians and military and sanctioned individuals. So it's really tough that there's victims on both sides. I mean, obviously, the, the Russian military and, and Putin are in the wrong, but uh, the civilians on both sides were pretty out of the loop on, on being able to control that. So what's interesting is that Bitcoin's asymmetric warfare or Bitcoin's ability to give you an asymmetric weapon against governments, this actually started back in the 1990s with the cypherpunks. These were the crypto pioneers um, that used to talk on this, uh, talk about how encryption would give humans freedom back. 
and how it could uh, you know move society forward for liberty and social change. And their ideas laid the foundation for Bitcoin, which is really really cool. And um, it, should, it should become it should be no surprise that like Adam Back, Hal Finney, those folks, they were all all these guys who you know we know them from the Bitcoin space, that they were um, you know early proponents and, and early advocates. And so they, in the 1990s, the NSA and U.S. military industrial complex wanted to ban encryption uh, because they thought that encryption was a weapons export, which is pretty wild um, because this is for the U.S. government to ban code is like good luck with that. You can just copy paste it. And like it was a pretty fruitless exercise to begin with. But the audacity that they would even try is insane. so what they did is these cypherpunks printed the code on a T-shirt and wore it around as like, hey, this is this is regarded as a as a munition or a weapons export. And um, what happened was the uh, actually the courts decided that um, that code is speech, which is a First Amendment protection, which is fantastic. And so what that means is that ultimately um, Bitcoin and code isn't censorable. It isn't stoppable under the U.S. government in terms of a legal protection because it's uh, free speech and but you know when we look at you know when we create this functional software and we express ourselves we express ourselves via code speech and other methods and so human code is just another form of that it, it, but bitcoin's code isn't just free speech it's it's you know free speech it's the asymmetric powerful uh, power for individual people to take their economic lives into their own hands you can self custody all your bitcoin holdings on a on a hundred dollar device the same way, whether it's a one-month emergency fund or a multi-million-dollar re- uh, retirement savings, no army or elected leader can stop you from spending it or sending it wherever you see fit. So, Bitcoin is a huge change for freedom. It is an asymmetric weapon to protect innocent sides in a war and creates a new type of power structure with, between governments and their population. If you enjoyed this, throw me a like, throw me a subscribe. helps helps with the algorithm gets and gets us more out to more people. And uh, see you later. Cheers. Bye.